About 10 years ago, I attended a workshop put on by a Writers Guild in Eugene. And during that evening, one of the speakers said something that I am still thinking about all these years later, and it was about imagination. And I wish I could remember who she was or what her role was so I could give her credit for this insight, but my notes from that occasion are lost in a journal somewhere I have tried many times in, vine, in vain to find. So wherever she is, whoever she is, I thank her for this transformative nugget. But here's, here's what she said. She said, your imagination is very powerful. And its greatest gift is that it will answer any question you ask of it. Any question you ask, your imagination can answer it. Just like that. Now let's try. What would happen if dinosaurs returned to roam the earth right now? What would happen if you became terribly ill tomorrow? What would it be like to attend church on virtual reality headsets? What would they, what would you, where would you go if they would create a bike that could fly? I mean, did it work? Did you start imagining some things? Maybe, yeah, okay, maybe just, the, the, it is powerful, but you've got to dust it off a little bit, the imagination. <laughs> so your imagination is very powerful, and allegedly, if you change the oil regularly over time, it can answer any question that you ask. But this woman said, the dangerous thing is that your imagination does not discriminate what questions it answers. Now, the speaker here was talking not about the work of writing itself, as in your imagination answering what will happen if your novel's character turns left at the stoplight. She was talking about the process of writing and being a writer. She said, for instance, if you were to ask your imagination, what would happen if you published an essay that contained some errors and was not actually perfect? your imagination would produce an answer to that question. In fact, it would start to spin a whole tale in response to that one thing, something like, well, clearly, everyone that I know and everyone who matters would read this essay, and they would all know that it's not perfect, and they would all deduce that you are, in fact, an imposter and not a good writer at all, and they would say as much in reviews using big but critical words like insipid and lackluster. And everyone you know and everyone who's important would read those too and they would probably not want to associate with you anymore and you may never get an invitation to write everything else ever again. You would die unfulfilled and despairing, having never fulfilled your dreams of writing that novel all because of this one essay is what could happen. You see? That was a powerful story from your imagination in response to a question that you asked. You see how that works? Now, does that ever happen to you? in a smaller way, it means that your imagination will answer whatever you ask of it, but maybe not always in a way that's very helpful in the end, or true. Your imagination will not discriminate, which I think means that we need to be a little circumspect about the questions that we ask our imagination to answer. Or put another way, we should be aware of what questions we're asking. And we should be able to assess whether those questions are actually serving us well. Because questions are so powerful too, right? How we ask questions and which questions we ask shape the conversations we have. And for better or worse, shape the way that we see the world and certainly the way that we see the future. So they deserve for us to be mindful about them. Which I think is important because what strikes me about this story that we heard Thad read just now is how many insipid and lackluster questions the people in these few verses ask Jesus. Now I know that was such a long reading and I thank Thad for sticking with it. I just couldn't cut it down because of all the ridiculous questions just go on and on. I kept thinking, okay, we're going to cut it off at 21 and 20, but no, nope, there's some more questions they ask in 27 and 30 and 31 and 40. You know, probably this is a familiar story. To some of us, Jesus and the disciples come across this blind man, and the disciples start, and Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents 
It's a question we should notice that Jesus summarily dismisses, along with it, the idea that illness is a punishment for sin. That's not how it works. And Jesus heals the man, then the questions really start coming. Did you notice all these, like the neighbors? Is this the guy who used to sit next to the road? As if they didn't know their own neighbor. And then they want to know how. How were his eyes open? That seems to be the question that dominates so much of the rest of the story. How did this happen? Tell us how. Now right there before them, this beautiful thing has unfolded. Their neighbor has been healed. Instead of celebrating that, they only want to know about the mechanics. But how did it work? Now, it is also clear to me this is a question that they're asking of their own imaginations because they clearly have no interest in the actual answer, which the man keeps repeatedly trying to tell them through the entire story. <laughs> Jesus healed me, but how did it happen? Well, Jesus put mud on my eyes and healed me. How did it happen? But Jesus, but how? But Jesus. And then the Pharisees get involved, and that's where it turns into a real mess, right? Their question is, does Jesus even have the authority to be doing any of this stuff? I mean, their question is, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And then they go to the guy's parents and they say, is this your kid here? As if they wouldn't know. And they say, the one who, was he really born blind? As if they might have gotten that part wrong. <laughs> and they ask them, how does he see? And the parents say, go ask him. And so they do. And the man himself, what did he do? How did it work? How did he open your eyes? And again, these questions don't seem to serve the actual pursuit of fact, but rather than the feeding of the Pharisees' suspicious imagination about Jesus and his intentions. And the formerly blind man, and I heard a few of you chuckle, so I know you got this, asked the best question the entire thing, which is, why do you need to hear? Do you want to be his disciples too? Yeah. Sarcasm in the Bible is alive and well. <laughs> But the Pharisees don't like it because then they get very persnickety, like, you, the sinner, are trying to teach us something. <laughs> well, he was trying to teach you, but you couldn't pick up what he was laying down clearly. And in the end, there's this interesting little scene that's just between the man who was healed and Jesus, and Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, who is he, sir? And they have this beautiful interchange in which he says, yes, I do believe, right? The one declarative thing, yes, I do believe. I don't need to ask any more questions. And those overhearing it say, wait a minute, are we blind too? I mean, it's such an interesting story. And because I can appreciate a good imaginative endeavor, I cannot help but imagining as I read this how it would have turned out so much differently if they had asked different questions. What if the disciples had said instead of who sinned, here is a man who is suffering. How can we help Jesus? And what if the neighbors, when they saw their friend restored to wholeness, instead of saying, how did it all work, had said, how can we celebrate with you? What if the Pharisees, who were the authority figures, instead of, is Jesus really supposed to be doing this, had said instead, how can we support this amazing healing ministry happening in our midst? What if instead of, are you trying to teach us, someone had said to the blind man, what wisdom can you share from this journey you have been on? Can you see how that might have made things different? And if you can, can you wonder with me, are there places in your own life where maybe asking a different question might serve you better? I ask because I know life presents all of us with so many questions that we can invite our in imaginations to go to work on. And some of them are really difficult. Why is this happening to me? What if things had turned out differently? What should I do? How can I help? And these are reasonable and natural questions. But if we get to the point in our life where we're feeling frustrated or stuck, like we're ending up in some existential dead end, unsure of God's summons to us. It may be the case, I think is the suggestion of this text. It may be the case that we're just not asking the best question for that moment. And that there may be other questions to ask that might serve us better, like, how is God present with me in this? How is hope alive in this future, even if it's not the one I imagined? What am I able to observe while I wait for direction about which way to go?
Now, you know, if you were here, that I asked a question in my sermon last week that seemed to have landed very heavily with a lot of you because more than normal, you talked to me about it afterward and followed up with me and sent me messages and stopped me in the hall. The question was just, what brought you here today? Like, what are you doing here? And the answers that you shared with me were wildly varied. Some of them were very positive things we could put on a bumper sticker, you know, coexistence, peace. Some were driven more by responsibility, right? Like, I signed up to make coffee, so I had to. (laughs) You know, and maybe that question, I was trying to think all week as people kept talking about this, maybe that question worked really well for you and helped you to get at why this experience might be valuable to you. It also occurred to me maybe it didn't work for some of you. Maybe it made you worry that if you only come because you're supposed to make coffee, then none of this is really doing its job. You know, and I just want to say, use this as a tiny example to say, if the latter is the case, then maybe you can always try a different question. Like, what happened once you got here? (laughs) What would you have missed if you didn't come? And I say all this because I really do believe that sometimes a good question is like a key that opens a door in your relationships, in our communities, and in our own hearts. And I think that in part because I've been studying this Jesus character for a long time too. And I noticed that Jesus asked some of the best questions imaginable. Questions that open people's hearts and minds again and again and again in the Gospels, almost exponentially more than he offers answers. He gives questions. If you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Why are you so afraid? How many loaves do you have? What do you want me to do for you? Why are you sleeping? What is your name? There are such powerful inquiries. And I think the invitation of the gospel is to be Jesus' disciples in asking such powerful things, too, of this world and of each other and also of ourselves. You know, I don't want to be the one saying, who sinned, but the one saying, is there a God so gracious that our sin would never count against us? I want to open my own heart and my own mind in ways that let God in and that let the Spirit's light shine and that let my imagination soar. And I want that for all of us. What might it be like if it were? I want to offer these questions in the name of the God who created, redeemed, and sustained us always. Amen.